give it up for Weapons of God one more time. Welcome to the First Heavy Metal Church of Christ. How's everybody doing today? Okay, Mo gets it, right? Is anybody here saved? All right, that's a little better. Welcome to the First Heavy Metal Church of Christ. If you're watching or listening for the very first time today, check us out at heavymetalchurch.com. Look us up under the First Heavy Metal Church of Christ on our Facebook page, and as always, Heavy Metal Church on Instagram. Does people use Twitter anymore? Right? I think Twitter's kind of a joke. We've got one. I thought about using it again, but I... No? Does anybody follow your Twitter, like, all the time? Do you tweet? I'm not a tweeter. So anyway, maybe we just won't do that. Real quick, announcement I did not make. If you're getting baptized today at the uh, polar bear, the eighth annual polar bear river baptism, uh, it's immediately after service. So basically what's going to happen is I'm going to go back there and change into my wetsuit. Uh, you guys go use the restroom, do whatever you ever have to do. If you don't know where we're going, uh, come around back here and just stay by my Jeep. And I'll come out at about 15, 20 minutes. And you can, or about 15 minutes. You can just follow me down there. And then Pinky... If you can bring the inventory and, and mow everything that you guys normally do, give it to Keith, and then let Keith know he's bringing it all down to the river, okay? Is that cool? And then one more deal. Um, it was so cool. We've got our first batch of satellite t-shirts. I want to give congratulations. I just picked up FHMCC Southern Manitoba t-shirts yesterday, and we will be mailing them to Canada. And with that being said, I want to give a shout out to FHMCC Bellevue, Washington, FHMCC Southern Manitoba, uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Morris, Illinois, which is going to be changing their name soon. Rock on. All right. We're, yeah. And if you would like to start your own uh, heavy metal church satellite in your city and state, whatever it may be, you don't need to be a pastor, a minister, ordained, or nothing. You just need to have a wonderful outgoing personality. You need to love Jesus and you need to have outreach on your heart. And we will, through the Holy Spirit, make that happen. It doesn't cost you a dime except for a background check. And that's like 25 or 30 bucks. So if you're interested, email me at bsmith at heavymetalchurch.com and we will set up a telephone interview. All right, let's get going. Today we are starting a three-week series where we're going to be discussing how a church or how the church should give, how the church should live, and how the church should love. How the church should give, live, and love. And we're going to be working out of 1 Corinthians 16, 13 today. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 16. And we're going to look at one verse this morning about how every follower of Jesus should live. How we should live. Are you living like a Christian should? Are you sold out to Christ. I mean, does this describe you? That verse is 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and it says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. So I want to say that again. This time I want you to close your eyes, close your eyes, and then I really want you to live this out. I want you to pretend that you are a soldier on the front lines of war you're getting instructions from your sergeant. There's booms, explosions, everything going on all around you. You've got that? You, you imagining it? Because here we go. Okay, troops, back up is coming. But until we get there, I need you to be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and be strong. You know, and you ah, like that. So you can open your eyes. But this is a wartime thing. Paul isn't telling the Christians or the Corinthians, how to be Christians. They're already Christians, okay? He's reminding them of how to live the Christian life. And if this sounds like military language to you, it's only because it is. Scripture says that every Christian has, by the grace of God, been made both a saint and a soldier. A saint and a soldier. Now, for me, it would be a saint and a hellion, but when God put salvation in your heart, he also put a sword in your hand, and that's what blows me away about, you know, some of the, when we were saying in announcements how some people make Jesus to be out like this wussified, passive hippie that, you know, whatever. Too many references of wartime and too much reference of armor and, and chains of command and battling the, the powers of evil and darkness. There's evil and darkness in human beings. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, 
I've been, I've been like raked over the coals before because I said if, you know, I'd have no problem if, it, if I could save a truckload of children that were on the way to get, you know, turned into sex torture slaves and I could knock out the driver and his helper and save them, you bet your butt I would. Well, you're, you're, you're supposed to love Jesus. We're supposed to love our enemies and you're gonna, you would kill them? Damn straight. Uh, those children? Those young children, don't you know what's going on? They're getting sold into slavery as young as babies. There's freaks, there's evil demons in human form out there that want to have sex with babies. Babies. You don't think I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have to repent about stopping somebody like that. You know what the Bible says? Jesus says you cause one of these little ones to sin, you cause them to stumble, it's better for you to tie a ship anchor around your neck and throw, drown yourself in the sea. That don't sound like a passive wuss to me, does it? I don't want to hurt anybody, but if it comes to saving the innocent, uh, the innocent and those that cannot help themselves, sign me up. Send all hate mail to bsmith at heavymetalchurch.com. Now, if you were a kid who went to VBS back in the day, you probably learned a song called, I'm in the Lord's Army. Anybody remember that? It's like march in the infantry. See, there's, here's more military and, and wartime, you know, lyrics. March in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. It's not just a song. It's the truth. It's the truth. And you've heard me say a million times, and Poe's amazing service last week, his message, amazing message last week, he said it. And why is God's army the only army on the planet that shoots their wounded? You know what I'm saying? We're, we're human and you're going to make mistakes. There, there's a chance that you could fall. Sometimes you could fall back into old ways and sometimes you could just make mistakes. And I've seen so many Christians that shun and make other Christians feel like they're worthless because they made a mistake or maybe they made the mistake 10 times in a row. But they're going through a desert period, a dry spell, uh, chasing their tail in the desert and we're supposed to love them back to health. And a lot of these Christians, man, push people away like they're, they're worthless or something. And that's not God. That's not Jesus. You know, Christians can suck. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Thought it'd be louder, but. Amen. But listen, it was never meant to be that way. You know, here at FHMCC, we try to be different. We have a lot of wounded people in here. And if you try to shoot one of them with self-righteousness, or a holier-than-thou attitude, we will shoo you right out the door. We will. And, uh, and, but usually we don't have to because they end up leaving on their own. All I, yeah, right? All I have to do is come up with a cool new PG-13 t-shirt or post an edgy Facebook post and they'll march right out that front door. I've always said the first heavy metal church of Christ is Pharisee repellent. It really is. I, I told you that story once, that pastor who just thought we were the devil and then I finally met him and after 20 minutes of telling him the story, you know, Pastor Brian, man, praise God for, for you and your ministry. You know, I really think you should go around a lot of these local churches and tell them what you're all about because I just think they've got the wrong idea. And I go, nope. And he's just taken back by that. He goes, what? No. Don't you want them to know? I'm like, nope, because just our name alone is Pharisee repellent. With a name like the First Heavy Metal Church of Christ, the Pharisee will not step foot on the property, let alone come in the door and taint our, our baby Christians or our people that might be struggling. We don't want that here. You know what I'm saying? So, amen. amen. Say it again. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, you therefore must endure hardship. Say it. Must endure hardship. So, that doesn't say you might, right? That doesn't say there's a good chance. It doesn't say four out of five dentists who recommend this. It don't say that, right? It says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So if you're not, now don't, don't like misconstrue hardship with your own stupid mistakes and decisions. You know what I'm saying? I've seen so many people make their own choices and when it comes time to pay the piper how could god or how could god let no 
You made poor choices, man. You will have to pay the piper for that. But in the spiritual world, your spiritual self, your mind, your heart, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Every Christian is a soldier at war. Now, I'm not talking about the Iraqi war or the Democrat-Republican war or the foosball team wars. Um, I, I knew I'd forgot something to bring out here. I brought my meme war veteran shirt. <laughs> It's like, uh, you know, the Vietnam veteran, all the different wars. Well, I got a meme war veteran shirt I was going to show you. But no, I mean, it's not a physical war. Now, our persecuted brothers and sisters overseas, that's a physical war. They're, they're you know, fearful of their lives. And, um, but I'm talking about a war that's invisible, yet very, very real. Most of your problems, it, not the ones where you made poor choices, okay, but most of your problems, most of your hurts, most of your sin, most of your confusion, most of your frustration in life have their roots very deep in this war that we're going to talk about today. The war I'm talking about, of course, is the cosmic clash between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan, a.k.a. the douchebag of the universe. It's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And you are not just in the middle of it. You are the battleground on which this fight takes place. So the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, gives these Corinthian Christians their last marching orders before he signs off. He's giving spirit-filled commands to Christian soldiers to help them live an effective Christian life in a very difficult world. Remember that movie, Saving Private Ryan? Man, this is what come onto my heart today. Uh, remember that coward, that, that coward journalist that watched the Nazi soldier kill one of his bros because he, he was too chicken uh, to go save him. He just sat there and watched his bro get stabbed in the heart. And, uh, and then he just sat there and cried watching it. And then... If it couldn't get any worse, then the Nazi just stood up, saw the guy cowering right there on the, on the stairs, and uh, he walked on down, the Nazi walked on down the steps right by the guy, didn't waste a bullet or the energy to stab him because he knew he was a coward and not a threat. What kind of a man does, does that where the enemy just walks right on by, doesn't even bother killing you, because he's looking like, you're no man. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know what? That describes to a T how Satan views some of you as a soldier in God's army. Oh, I forgot my cricket machine. Forgot something else. I'm, oh, and I'm talking about some of you people watching today too. You, yeah. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Saving Piper Ryan. They, and I just watched, and it's like you wanted to, when that guy was, his friends sitting there getting killed, he's, he's inches away from breathing his last breath before that knife goes in. And you wanted to jump through that TV, save him, and then go kick that wimp down the steps. I mean, I was so angry watching that, you know? But that's it. Satan looks at some of you like that. You got saved, but you are and may forever be a potato peeler mm. or a paint chipper. Jimmy, you here? Jimmy's not here. He knows uh, Jimmy is in the, was in the Navy. He knows what a paint chipper is. In the Navy, a paint chipper is someone that messes up so often or does something so stupid. Um, a lot of the times it even happens in boot camp. I mean, it's whatever that they will send them straight to the fleet with no school, no training, um, and pretty much the rest of they strip them of all rank and they send them out as a paint chipper. And your two, four, or six years are pretty much going to be used as just being on the ship, chipping paint, painting things that need to be painted, taking out trash, and serve the ship and the real soldiers. You know what I'm saying? So don't be a potato peeling, paint chipping Christian. And there's a whole bunch of them out there. And again, I, you know, I always say 80%. And some of you are thinking, man, but that's a little mean of saying that. No, guys. There's a, I'm not saying that that 80% is not saved. I'm not saying, you know, anything like that. But that's the number that has always come to my heart 
And you know, sometimes I drop it to 10 when I'm really mad is the 90-10 deal. But 80% of Christians don't do what they're supposed to do as a follower of Christ. 80% of Christians out there, I believe with all of my heart, probably have never said the salvation prayer with somebody. Let that sink in. We're supposed to. I mean, you would think you would at least want one to go to heaven with. You know what I'm saying? The Bible is so blunt right there. And yet, I love that. Oh my gosh, who said that? You guys see that thing um, I posted? There's some pastor or preacher or something out there. He goes like this. Now brace yourselves, church. Betty will love this because this is her favorite word. But it's, um, it goes like this. It goes like last night, 30,000 children starved to death in the world. And sadly, most of you don't give a shit about it. And then the next sentence says, and even sadder is most of you are more worried about me just saying shit than the fact that 30,000 kids died last night. That, my friends, just described 80% of the Christian church of America. The reason why I know this is because I live this. On a, you know what I'm saying? If you watch anything or follow anything we do, I, I've got a pretty big ever-growing fan club. All right? And, uh, and I'm okay with that. Because, and look, man, I, I, I'm not saying I do everything right, and maybe sometimes I should have went left instead of right, and whatever. I'm not saying we are perfect, but I'm saying I'm really starting to get it. It's a shame when some Christian will badger me for two weeks straight. You know, M Mr. Cox, and um, if you're watching The Unplugged, and they're saying, I'm not, but I'm not trying to uh, personally attack him, but what I'm saying is, is he spent more time and energy to taking our videos and posts and going to every Christian Facebook page in the world and spending hours posting this link to talk about this heretic in Dayton, Ohio. And, uh, you know, imagine if he just spent that time and energy trying to save lost people and trying to love people, you know? And so that's what I'm saying, you know, 80%. I mean, the, he just said shit. Well, what about the kids? What about the dying people? They're all going to hell. You're going to worry more about my language than you are about what we were supposed to do when we get saved and we become a soldier in God's army is to go out and love people, make God number one in your life, love people like you love yourself. You know what I mean? We're supposed to love our brothers and sisters. If TJ stumbles and falls, we're not supposed to beat him to death. We're supposed to go circle him, love him, pray for him, and love him back to health. And it's not going to happen overnight. It could, but it probably won't. You know, do you, your own children, do you, do you kill them, kick them, beat them to death when they, they can't learn to walk quick, as quick as the other kids do? How can we live an effective Christian life in a difficult world? This world is difficult and it's getting more and more difficult. It seems like every month now. So how can we live an effective Christian life in this, in this world? Number one, stay alert. Say stay alert. He says, be on your guard be on your guard. In the original text, it's just one word. It's watch. Say watch. It's a military word that means be vigilant, alert, and on guard. They would put watchmen on the walls that would watch for any danger coming their way. Their job was so important, check this out, their job was so important that if they got caught sleeping, they would be put to death I think, is it instantly? It doesn't sound, but it sounds like instantly. It doesn't sound like they're going to sit on death row for 13 years and let the tax people pay for their cable television heat and three, three hot in a cot. You know what I'm saying? It almost sounds like they just took care of business right there. Their job was so important. So many people's lives relied on these watchmen that if they got caught sleeping, they would put to death because the consequences could be catastrophic for the entire army. Let me ask you, how much damage can be done in one unguarded moment in your life? Your life, your walk with God, or your marriage, it can be totally derailed, 
unhinged, broken in an instant, if you're not on watch protecting it. We watch, not living in fear, but guarding what's precious. So Paul says, stay alert, be on your guard, watch out. Watch out for what? Watch out for Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Oh, Brian, we're far too enlightened to believe those childhood stories now, to believe in a literal Satan. Listen, the most dangerous wars is the one that you don't even realize you're in. And the most dangerous enemy is one that you don't believe exists. And you say, Brian, are you saying there's this little horned red guy running around in his long underwear waving a pitchfork? Woogie boogie. You know what I'm saying? No. The Bible says he cleverly camouflages himself. He has like a ghillie suit on. You guys know what a ghillie suit is? A ghillie suit, it, it, they're awesome. Um, you put this on and it just looks like you're a big pile of weeds. That's what the snipers use, man. They can just lay in the middle on the grass and you can't, you'll just look right by them because they look like part of the environment. They don't look human. Satan is a military genius. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 even says he masquerades as an angel of light. He doesn't even look scary. He looks sexy. He can look sexy to you. He doesn't approach you like an enemy, but rather like a friend. How bad has it hurt in your life when you thought you had a great, great friend and then they just stab you in the back? You know what I'm saying? We've all been through that, at least most of us have. That hurts so bad that, you know, that you, that you would rather be punched in the face like a thousand times and have somebody that masquerades as your good friend and then they are just cutting you down behind the scenes. You just don't recognize the enemy. You don't recognize Satan because he's that slick. It doesn't mean he's not real. Seriously. There's been, a, and so many devils have come and gone through churches throughout the years. You know what I'm saying? Satan joins the church now. He does it, he joins it. That's how he causes the most waves and dissension and distraction is he joins the church. Satan is a smooth criminal. He will lure, he will lure you in like let's say with the secretary, you know what I'm saying? He'll, he'll lure you in with the secretary flirting with you every day, little subtle flirts, and, and then you slowly start to flirt back. And now you're either a husband or a wife. You guys are going through a rough patch in your marriage. So then you start to desire speaking to this secretary or this person at work more than you do your own spouse now. Then finally, it just takes a turn for the worse and you have a knockdown drag out with your spouse now you fall into the arms of Satan for emotional and then sexual counseling. Satan is the ultimate chess player. You know, I could, I, I'm, I'm not that good at chess. I know how to play. But really, people that are really good at chess, they've already had their next five, ten moves already, you know, planned out. So Satan already has his next five to ten moves planned out in advance, and you just walked right into his trap. Here's the deal. I mean, this is the truth. Satan already knows that when you're going to get through this battle, when you're going to overcome and all this kind of stuff, and he already has the next stage, the next person he's going to throw in your way, the next something, the next thing that the boss is going to say to trigger you, the next thing, I mean, whatever. And remember, if you're married, flirting is the second cousin to cheating. It is. Flirting is the second cousin to cheating. And Satan has gotten, has destroyed more families for what started out as just an innocent flirt. Just an innocent, you know what I'm saying? And it just escalates from there. I remember, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but you guys know, uh, it's a 1981, I think you, a blind singer, Terry Gibbs. Anybody remember that? Terry Gibbs, he had that uh, hit song called Somebody's Knockin'. It, that's a country song, right? Oh my gosh. Somebody's knocking. Should I let him in? Lord, it's the devil. Would you look at him? I've heard about him, but I've never dreamed he'd have blue eyes and blue jeans. That's pretty deep, right? But it's true. 
Let me remind you, Satan does not give up on you when you become a Christian. No, no, not at all. Because even though he can't drag you to hell with him anymore, you just simply go from his teammate to his target. His teammate to his target. His opposing teammate. Satan doesn't give up on you. He just changes his strategy. Remember what Jesus said to Peter at the Last Supper? Simon, Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. Satan hadn't given up on Peter. Rather, he focused in on him. Satan is at work in your life somewhere right now. Somewhere right now. Do you know where? See, that's, that's a scary. If you don't know where, that's petrifying. Okay? Because I know where he's at and, and messing with me in my life right now. So knowing is half the battle. So do you know where? Do you? I know I, it's like I have to fight mine every day, once a week, once a month, whatever. You know, and it's like it's a constant fight. And it could be a fight for the rest of your life. Some days you win the battle, some days you don't. But you never quit. Don't ever quit. Hold your hand up and say, I will never quit. When I first started this circus, about a year, well, I don't even know if it was a year. Uh, it might have been within the first few months. I had this pastor up north, you know, he wanted to have lunch and everything and talk about this crazy idea. And he actually picked me up and he was driving me back home. And he goes, hey, man, I just want to tell you something. Don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. He goes, you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to stumble and fall. It's, it's human. You're going to. It's a, it, it's a fact. But when you do, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't let Satan get in your ear. Don't let Satan get in your head and say, no, you repent, you restore, and you keep moving forward. Don't ever quit. You know, and that, that's what's so hard for some pastors that try to live this pedestal life that their congregation puts on them. You see what I'm saying? And when they fall, they fall hard. You guys, I thought I heard some snoring out there, man. Come on. Thank you, Jelly Bean. Just don't ever quit. That's the biggest thing in the world. Don't compare yourself to other Christians. They're all jacked up. I'm serious. You think you're jacked up? Oh, my goodness. There's some jacked up Christians out there. They might appear to be all squeaky clean. You know, remember I told you that, that pastor I was talking to you that one time. I, I look at this pastor. I watch how he lives. I watch how he talks and, and everything. I, I can find no fault in this man. Yeah, sure, he might blow up every now and then. I'm talking, I know he's not perfect, but... He's a heck of a lot more perfect than me, or at least he appears to be. And I said, I was like, bro, I love you. And I know I, I struggle all the time with this, that, and none the other. And I fall down and I scrape my uh, whatever. I was like, I know we're all jacked up in some way, shape, or form, but you seem like you're not. I go, right, please tell me you're jacked up somehow. And he paused and he, he said, Brian, he goes, yeah, of course I am. And he said, if I told you what it was, you would be like, oh, really? I don't need to know what it was. That, oh, really? That's all I needed to hear right there. And that's every single human being on this planet from Marilyn Manson to Billy Graham. All right? Everywhere, all across the, the spectrum. Satan is at work in the life of this church somewhere. Somewhere in here now, I tell my leadership team all the time to stay aware because of the cause, the seed, the cause of our next church split is sitting here right now in this crowd somewhere or is getting ready to start and join the church somewhere or, you know, eventually days from now. It never ends. That's what it is. It's never going to end. Think about it. There, I mean, even the zombie movies and all these, uh, war, there's always like some bonehead in every group, right? He laughs. He's know what I'm talking about. You're not a bonehead, are you? Are you that bonehead, sir? I wonder why you sit there by yourself all the time, man. No, I'm joking, dude. <laughs> I'm totally joking. Um, but seriously, think about it. You know, everybody starts out as cool, 
And then all of a sudden, you know, this guy, his pride gets hurt, his ego gets hurt. Next thing you know, he's, he's talking smack about the leader and trying to get people. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's a, there's a war going on within. Next, we're supposed to watch out for temptation. Who in here gets tempted? You better all raise your hand, you liars. Yes, thank you, sir. I'm, I got two hands, look at that. It's like this. You know, it's not a sin to be tempted. I know some people think, you know, you're tempted. Oh, man, I've messed up because I was even thinking about doing that. And Satan will beat you up for that. No, it's not a sin until you actually do it. You see what I mean? So cut yourself some slack. Understand that Satan can't make you do any sin. He can't make you, but he tries to lure you into every sin. Every sin that has ever sprouted up and bloomed first started with a little old seed of temptation. What did Jesus tell the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Now, how do we watch for Satan and temptation? He just said it right there, prayer. I'm not talking about the long laundry list of things you want from God. I'm talking about worshipful, worshipful and grateful communion with him. See, the more mature you get in Christ, all of these gimme, 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 gimme prayers, you won't do them anymore. Because finally you're going to get to a point where you realize you don't know what the hell you want or what you need. Okay? I'm going to think about it. How many times you just thought you had to have this or this is what I... Only to find out, oh, heck no. I told you that story before. The one time I got mad at God in my life, I was in my 20s. I prayed and prayed, and I had the faith to move this mountain, and I was just going to get this because I knew what I needed. I needed. I needed her to be happy, to be happy in my life, and God said no. I got mad, and then a couple of years later, I'm like, thank you for not answering that prayer. I would have been miserable for the rest of my life. Yeah. When you mature in Christ, you start praying, Lord, I don't know what I want or need, but you do, so here's the keys, here's the steering wheel, just please open and close every door according to your will for my life. Amen. You know what I mean? Because that's how I pray. I can't, I'm, you know, yeah, anyway, I could, we could do a whole sermon on that. Prayer. I'm talking about worshipful, well, that's a hard word, worshipful, worshipful, say it, TJ, say it real quick three times. Yeah, right, worshipful, worshipful, worshipful. I'm talking about worshipful and grateful communion with him. Prayer isn't about opening God's eyes to your needs. It's about God opening your eyes to the spiritual battle around you and awakening your desperation for him. It is in prayer he gives you his eyes to see, his mind to understand, his wisdom to act, and his peace to stay calm. It's like this, you know, again, a lot of your, and again, there's nothing wrong with being a mature or an immature Christian as long as you're growing. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, remember how I compared, you know, some people think, well, okay, I really need God to move in this area, so I'm going to go get 50 people to pray nonstop for me because then God will have to do it. No, you know, it's not, some people treat God like, you know, like in Mortal Kombat when, or the games where you got to power up to, and then if you power up more than the enemy or whatnot, you kick his butt. A lot of people treat prayer like that. Well, I know I'm really not quite where I should be with God right now. So if I go get 50 holy rollers and we can get together and all pray in one accord, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. No. God would rather hear from you with a truthful, you're the only one that's gonna pray about something like that better than anybody else. You can get 50 people to pray for your, you know, what? Your sick mother over here or something like that. And really it's you. They're not gonna be able to pray as heartfelt and as emotional and as compassionate as people that don't even know her. Does that make sense? God wants to hear from you. He's not a power up. Oh, okay, I got 100 people to pray, so I've got better odds of get, answering that prayer. Not at all. Nope. Does that making sense? Okay. What's that? You can't tempt God. God is God. His ways are not our ways. His heart is not our heart. And his mind is not our mind. 
I've seen God heal before, 100%. I'm talking had a tumor, had like cancer in op, went back, it was gone. And then two years later, it came back and then gone. There must have been something in that two year span that God needed that only that person could do. Does that make sense? We all have to go someday. You know what I mean? So really, prayer is supposed to be intimate. Prayer is supposed to be heartfelt, not just a bunch of words. If, if you're caught in that rut, like I used to be years ago, just I would pray on my drive to work. It was a five-mile drive. The same almost repetitive prayer every morning just to mark something all, okay, I prayed today. No, I didn't. I recited a, it might have well been one of those like Catholic prayers or something, the same ones over and over and over. What's that? The mantra, all that kind of stuff, because it was the same thing. And then as soon as I pulled into work, amen, check that off that list. God's proud of me now. It doesn't work that way. Huh? Religion, that's religion. I want a relationship, man. I, I, and I'm getting tired of hearing that because people are like over saying that out there, you know, and it's like, but it's true. It's a relationship. I don't want religion. There's enough religions out there. Religions are what start wars. Religions are what saws people's head off. Religions are, no, not, not God, not a relationship with Jesus. It is love. It is a, a God that loves us so much that he said, man, my babies, they're not going to make it up here with me, so I'm going to have to do something about that. And he left his throne and come down here and made us away. Watch out for apathy. Apathy is the absence of passion, the absence of interest or concern. Spiritual apathy is a lack of passion, interest, or concern about the things God tells us to have passion, interest, and concern for. And this ain't even part of my message. What I just thought of as I'm reading that is the Great Commission. Crickets! It's the Great Commission. Listen. Apathy is the absence of passion, interest, or concern. Spiritual apathy is a lack of passion, interest, or concern about the things God tells us to have passion, interest, and concern for. More people are going to hell every hour out of the 6,000 people that die. A lot of your family right now, friends, acquaintances are lost. If they died right now, they're going to hell. We just go right on about our business. That's apathy, man. Remember what Jesus said to the church in Sardis? Revelation 3, 2 through 3 says, Wake up! I saw some of you sleeping. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Many of us are so spiritually sedated, so blinded by spiritual apathy, we don't even realize we're just months or weeks or days or even moments away from the catastrophic consequences. The Corinthians were not alert and the enemy was destroying their marriages, their homes, their churches, their faith, and their lives. Paul says to live an effective Christian life in a difficult world, number two, we must stand firm. Say stand firm. Paul tells the Corinthians, stand firm in the faith. Stand firm. Firm means to be deeply, resolutely, and securely entrenched. Not haphazardly, not half-heartedly, not nonchalantly. Firm, rooted, and steadfast. You remember the movie, The 300? That's one of my favorite movies when it comes to good and evil, you know, Satan and God and, and the battle of evermore. It's, uh, man, they would lock and get deeply you know, down into that dirt like that and create a wall, a wall, a wall, a wall like that. And then the enemy would come and they were so deeply rooted, they would slide back and then, and then push them back all in one motion and just start stabbing them, man. It was just a great thing to watch. That's how a body should work together, deeply rooted, protecting the weak. The weak were in the back, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the wounded. So now listen, we need to be firmly rooted and steadfast. Steadfast in what? In the faith. Notice it's not your faith. We all know our faith is up, down, and all around. Remember what I said? It seems like when you're on the mountaintops, that's when you're the best Christian that you're ever going to be because you're just filled with 
Holy Spirit and power and adrenaline and nitrous oxide and the devil just, I ain't messing with him or her right now. I'll wait until they hit a valley. Sometimes it's strong, you know. Sometimes your faith is so strong. Sometimes it's weak. Not stand firm on your faith. He says, in the faith. What's the faith? He's talking about the body of doctrine contained in Scripture. He's talking about standing firmly and resolutely in the gospel, in the Christian faith, in the Word of God. Because faith isn't going anywhere. It's as strong today as it was 2,000 years ago. In essence, Paul is saying, know God's word. Know the Bible. Believe in God's word. Believe that Bible. Base your life on God's word. Defend the Bible. Defend God's word. But before you can, you got to know it. You got to know what's in there. Some of you just rely on this every Sunday thing. You've been doing it for years. It's not enough. Jude, uh, Jude 3 says, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Jude says, contend for the faith. He goes on to tell us why and that it's because people are coming in who corrupt the faith. They preach a new gospel or a different gospel. So we are to contend for the faith so that people will know what it is. C.S. Lewis said, good philosophy needs to exist because bad philosophy already does. There is a lot of bad thinking about Jesus, a lot of bad thinking about the Bible and about the church. Sadly, it's by Christians not, re not representing Jesus accurately. I said this to somebody yesterday. Um, he was, we spoke on the phone, I forget where he's from. Um, he's wanting to search and find, for, uh, find God. You know, it's like he's now an agnostic and he had a horrible um, experience with church as a kid and in his earlier life. And now he feels God's, something's happening where he, he goes, how can I have assurance? How can I have proof that he really exists? So I was like, man, can I call you? So, so we spoke, you know, and that's it. It's Christians. I, I've been saying this for, nine and a half years it's christians that are doing that because here's what i told the guys like there's and you've heard it before there's only two reasons why the entire world is not sold out to jesus and a christian and one is because they haven't met a christian and number two because they have and they don't want any part of it we are to be people who know the truth of the Bible and stand firm in and contend for it. 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 14 says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard that good deposit entrusted in you. We are to contend for the Christian faith. We are to guard the Christian faith. But listen, you cannot guard that which you do not know. You know, again, you've heard it before. People get bent over the silliest things. The break room, you've got the, the non-saved person, the unsaved person that says GD. I've heard it a hundred times in my life. Some snooty, prideful Christian will say, oh, that offends me. Do not say that. That is my Lord and Savior. Well, whoop de doo you know, there's a better way to handle Matter of fact, just don't say anything. God's going to judge you more harshly for judging the lost person for saying it than he's going to judge the, the lost person right now. You know what I mean? And it, it, people think GD is the ultimate, oh, no, no, no. I told you, you stub your toe and say, oh, God, that hurt. Oh, that's just like saying GD. You're using the Lord's name in vain. Vain means without purpose, for no purpose at all. You cannot contend for that which you do not know. We are to be constantly learning and growing in God's word and in accurately understanding the Christian faith. You see, the more you grow, the more firmly you will stand. Satan always attacks your faith in God by attacking what you believe about God's word. Did you know that? Let me read it again. Satan will always, Satan always attacks your faith in God by attacking what you believe about God's word. Satan's first attack is always at the truthfulness of God's word. Because if he can get you to doubt God's word, he will get you to doubt God's heart. If he can get you to doubt God's truthfulness, he can get you to doubt his reliability. All the way back in Genesis, Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden, 
What was Satan's first question to Eve? Did God really say not to eat of the trees in the garden? From the very beginning, he started by putting doubts in people's minds as to the truthfulness of God's word. It's just crazy. You know, the whole, um, again, I, the, we did the, the homosexual uh, sermon. You know, if you want to watch it, go to our YouTube, and it's the two um, titles that have a, like something to do with Rainbow. I think one of them is Rainbow the Band. The other one is Rainbow in the Dark uh, from Ronnie James Dio. And it's like, man, and it's like, it was so amazing because God loves homosexuals. Their sin is not worse than every other sin. Christians treat them like dirt. But the thing is, well, you won't hear. I'll, we already said, anybody that treats our people bad, we'll kick your butt out. Because that ain't what Jesus is about. But what it was is we were saying that a lot of the homosexual community, they, they get that, well, I don't care what that says over here in the New Testament. That can't be right because I'm in love and God is love, so God's okay with it. That's the mistake right there. If a homosexual will just simply acknowledge that it says it right there in a couple other places in the New Testament, but I can't change myself. That's when you take it to the cross. You say, God, I, I love you. I want to be saved. Be saved. Homosexuals can be saved, but you just can't say that the Bible don't say that because then that's picking and choosing. The Bible's offensive. It, it's a rated R book filled with offensive stuff. You know, there's things in there that offends me. And this earpiece is getting on my nerves. I'm sorry, guys. But I'm serious. We cannot deny God's word. And that's, that was a game changer, you know. If, if, if homosexuals will just, because you know, they feel the Holy Spirit just like we do. They're not aliens. They're people. Good, honest, loving, caring people. And the Christians that have the most problem with them are just homophobes. That's why they think they're, ooh, because they're homophobes, man. You saw me kiss my brother right up here on stage that one day. I ain't a homophobe. I'm comfortable with my manhood. You know, this is, this is getting on my nerves, man. I'm sorry, guys. But I'm serious. You know, we're all in this together. There's no sin worse than the other. I'm just saying confess your sins, repent of your sins. There are sins so deeply embedded in you that you're never going to be, there's no self-help group. There's no, the only thing that's going to rewire your heart and mind to not do certain things anymore is God. And it could take an entire lifetime to get to that point. Don't wait to clean yourself up. You're never going to clean yourself up good enough. If Billy Graham were to wait until he was 98 years old, you know, Billy, Billy, He's not here with us anymore, but he, he wouldn't have been good enough at, at, at his age the year that he died. That's why we needed a savior. So please, there's nothing in your life that you are doing or have done that will make God love you any less than he does right now. You see, you cannot, you cannot trust God if you do not believe God. And if you cannot trust God and believe God, you will not love God. And if you cannot trust God, believe God and love God, you can never be saved by God. That's why everywhere you look, there is an attack on the validity and truthfulness of Scripture. The Bible says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We are there now in 2021. Can you, you agree with me on that? I've noticed that for, for the past decade now. People are calling, we're the whack jobs, we're the old school, we're the, you know, oh, you don't need to be married. That's just, that's... That's so 100 years ago. You know what I'm saying? We're the whack jobs. They're calling evil good and good evil. They're accepting, you know, they're, they're trying to push pedophilia through that it's okay. The man, that's just, you know, that's no different than somebody that's gay or somebody that, are you kidding me? A good gay person is disgusted by pedophilia. But they're trying to push that in like, oh no, this is, we were made this way. They're trying to ride on the homosexual coattails, man. And that, that we were made this way. That's an abomination to an almighty God is hurting a child. Sexually anyway, but sexually hurting a child. Whew. That's why everywhere you look, there is an attack on the validity and truthfulness of Scripture. When you're reading the Bible, if you will listen really, really close, you will hear Satan whisper into your spiritual ear, some very familiar words. Did God really say this? Is this really true? 
And you have a choice. You can stand firm in the faith or you can waver, wander, and walk your own way. But it also goes in the opposite direction. If, if he cannot get a Christian to sway the wrong way, then he will go the opposite in the form of legalism. All right? So you, you, I, I know I can't get Billy over here, Billy and, and Susie. Uh, they're, they're not going to denounce God, but we can turn them into to legalistic freakazoids. So they take a scripture, man, you know, I've got to be modest before the Lord. So then it becomes, okay, a, a dress code. And then it becomes, well, if you don't dress this way and look that way, you're sinning and going to hell. That's legalism. If you listen to this music right here, that's it. You're going to hell because, because we're supposed to stay away from all evil things of the world. Well, how is Christian rock evil? Well, because rock and roll is evil and they're mimicking the, the, the world's music. Well, who ever said that rock and roll was the world's music? Just because you like bluegrass don't mean I have to. Uh, there's nothing wrong with bluegrass. It's just that's not my jam. All right? And it's like there's no such thing as Christian music, only Christian lyrics. Because a G is a G. Right? You guys are... Right? <laughs> Woo-hoo! Hi, Sean. How you doing? Sing for us. Okay. We'll see you. Now, you see? Normally, I could just start singing when I say... No. Okay, hey, all right. Chat out. Here we go. So, um, yeah, the modesty thing, you know, people will take that and run with it. Now, all of a sudden, that's why my cousin Mike, I loved what he said. The Baptists are known for putting on their Sunday best for Sunday. And he said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. For the ladies to come in with their beautiful dresses on and for the guys to come in with their suits and three-piece suits and the kids with their, you know, they're uncomfortable because they have the, there's nothing wrong with that. You're welcome here dress like that but my cousin said what what becomes sin is when they then start to frown on the person that walks in with flip-flops cargo shorts on and an acdc shirt on they think they're more saved or more mature or a better christian than the coolest guy actually in the church that walks in with an acdc shirt on and cargo shorts and flip-flops they turned it into doctrine that's a sin it's legalism. That is a sin. They will push that person away, just like the story of, a, a, I think it was a Baptist church. This woman come in, she dressed, from what I hear, not here, not at our church, they better never do that here, um, but she dressed pretty, really provocative. I'm talking like, that's just how she dressed. She comes in, she's wanting to see what this Jesus is all about. She comes in kind of looking like, dressing like, pretty woman. Yeah, so, and you know what they do? The pastor changes his sermon for the day and starts preaching. Evidently, you'd have to be an idiot not to see that she was directing, he was directing it at that first timer. She got up and left in the middle of the service. And you know what that ass clown said? Said, ha, we scared that devil off. True story, true story. I would not want to be standing next to that self-righteous prick on judgment day. What do you think? Now, people watching, some of you in here, you're more shocked and concerned that I just said prick than that prick that probably lost that woman forever because he judged her by her appearance. You see how twisted this world is? Man, I could throw this clipboard down right now, Poe, and just go for it, man. Mm. Paul says, stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith. We're coming to the end, kind of. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Listen to me close. While most Christians revere the Bible, most, most, say most, don't even read it. I would love to go. Who in here considers this your home church? Seriously, just put your hands up. Rex, I thought you would think this is your home church, man. 
you just rocked my world, boy. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay, yeah, whatever, okay. But seriously, you can put them down. Now, for all you that really consider this your church home, for any of you that I could go home with you right now and find out if you've ever bought the book Beautiful Outlaw, I get it. I would, yes, thank you. But there's people that still haven't done that. And this is supposed to be your church home. I'm supposed to be the, the, I hate the word. Go ahead and say it so I don't have to. I'm supposed to be that guy, okay? And yet you won't listen to me. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that picture? You know, wake up. Get off your butt. We'll even give you the thing if you can't afford it. I'm serious. We, I just gave a copy away yesterday. So it's like, if you're going to get up and come here on Sundays and you're going to go through this, shouldn't you be doing some of the stuff that I say to do, that God puts on my heart to tell you to do? And what does that say about you if I've been sitting here telling you to buy a book for three years now that it will truly bless you and give you a, a great perspective unlike you've ever had and you still haven't done it? Am I trying to guilt trip you? Absolutely. 100%. Is it working? I hope. And if it's not, if you're getting all prideful, oh, I can't believe he said that. I'll never be back. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Because you're like teats on a bull anyway. I said it. <laughs> what are teats on a bull good for? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I'm so glad we're not part of any denomination or affiliation. You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't that suck if we were getting letters in the mail every week? Now, Brian, you can't say prick at a church service. Watch me. All right. I'm going to stomp on this thing, dude. I think my ears are big enough I could hang a satellite dish on it. Gosh. All right. Listen. Most don't read it. Now here, Bible illiteracy among Christians is so extraordinarily high, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. You cannot stand firm in the faith revealed in God's word without a comprehensive study of the book. If you just come here once a week, or if you're going to your home, or if you're watching online, thank you, we want you to watch our extended members all across this world. But if this is all the Jesus, all of God's word that you're getting, it's not enough. You're going to be a paint chipper. And we don't want you to be a paint chipper. We want you to be a, yeah! Give me your rebel yell. Yeah! Yeah! yeah. I think Kim's got balls. That's my girl. There's an ACDC. Oh, I should name the, there's an ACDC song called She's Got Balls. I should name. Now, some of you in here are more concerned that I just said balls than knowing that 6,000 people die every hour and most of them are going to hell. You see what I'm saying? There's a reason why we've turned more PG-13. Really, because I'm just having fun with it. I'm just, it's great to watch legalistic people's head explode. <laughs> Seriously, because they're putting more into the stupid stuff. You know what I'm saying? The stupid stuff that really don't, well, that's unwholesome talk. The script, no, unwholesome talk is badgering me for two weeks and slandering me and this church all over Facebook on hundreds of church pages worldwide. That's unwholesome talk. You see what I'm saying? I'm sure his, I just, scanners, I'm really practicing at that movie, Scanners. Yes, all right. You have to comprehensively study the book. The truth is, if you say you believe the Bible, yet barely read it, you're fooling yourself, just like that amazing stick song. You're, yeah, I do too. You're fooling yourself. And even worse, you're exposing yourself to the lies and deception of the enemy. Now listen, 
if, um, if you're going to stand on God's word, you must get into it or you don't know what you're standing on. Listen, I, I knew this guy once that baby Christian, he, he saved baby Christian all of his life. Never read the Bible, only ran to God when his, when his life hit a, a calamity or something like that. Tell you straight up, I believe in Jesus, believe God on the cross for my sins, I believe he's God in human form, all this stuff. Well, then he moves and he goes and lives somewhere for nine years. And all of a sudden he comes back. Oh yeah, I met this person down there. I'm just so spiritually grown and I've just come so far. I'm not like I used to be. I'm like, oh yeah, what, what, church, um, what church is it down there? That, that, where did they go? Yeah, she used to come over once a week, man. And she would just talk to me and tell me God's where I'm just, I feel so good now. Well, what kind of church do you go to? I don't know, Jehovah's, what was it, uh, Jehovah's Witness? Yeah, I'm like, dude, listen. That's false doctrine. What are you talking about? She's so nice. I could just feel the Holy Spirit and God. It's false doctrine. They don't believe Jesus was God in human form. They don't believe. They honor his death because... They don't believe, if I'm not mistaken, well, that's enough right there. To, it's a false doctrine, but something about they don't believe. Like when I got a, a flyer on my door, it said, come and celebrate the greatest death of all time. How about the resurrection of the one true God on Easter? We ain't gonna celebrate his death. We're gonna celebrate his resurrection. That's what Easter's about. But you see how a military genius is so slick, so slick. Just change that little bit. And if you don't know God's word, you have been deceived and you're going to deceive others and you may not even be saved. So um, I know God's word. Look, you know, I, I'm sure there's Bible scholars out there that, you know, whatever, like they've got the entire Bible. Jack Van Eppy, shoot, man. He had like the entire, was it the entire Bible or just Revelation? But he had it memorized, man. He's a walking Bible, absolutely. But um, I'll tell you what, I have enough of God's word. I know the Bible from start to finish, and I've got it sewed on my soul so deeply that if, if all Bibles were forbidden and taken away and we could never see one again, never pull one up on the internet again, I've got enough foundation and solidity of God's word knitted into the fabric of my soul that I know nobody could ever deceive me. Okay, nobody could come and say, well, no, because I know when we had Bibles, the Bible said this, and you're telling me something else, and that is not right. But some of you don't even know the Bible like that, like the guy that was in Florida. He don't, he got deceived, and I had to, oh gosh. Is it, you think Satan works through objects? I mean, this is like an expensive mic. I've always wanted one, and now I regret buying it. So, you really have to know God's word. Because then, what if I was a false, a heretic? You know what I'm saying? And you're just relying on me every week. If you don't have God's word sown in your heart, how do you know I'm not full of, of crap? You know what I mean? So, I'm full of crap, all right, but that's a different kind of crap. I have a bidet. Paul then says, to live an effective Christian life in a difficult world, we must, in the last one, is show maturity. Say, show maturity. He says, be courageous. The ESV version takes the more literal approach in its translation. It says, act like men. Act like men. The word is, I'm going to mess this up, andrizomai. Andrizomai. It literally means to be manly. Now look, this isn't just directed to men, but to women as well. You talk about politically incorrect, right? That's, that's what somebody would say about this. Yeah, but we don't play those reindeer games. Those reindeer games here at FHMCC, we are not politically correct. It gets us uh, in trouble all the time. Some, uh, it does, man. I don't understand that because we have a lot of fun on the church page. And uh, even a Muslim thought it was funny. TJ's friends with a Muslim. And some guy, two guys got on and just raked us over the coals and said that I am a xenophobe, racist, angry, hater, um, and it says some really horrible stuff that hurt my feelings because I know the family. Uh, I don't know this guy, but I know the family. I'm just trying not to give too much away. And all I did was post it. It was, uh, what's that? Is that a burqa? Uh, the, what the Muslim ladies wear that covers their whole body except for this, that little strip right there? Well, it had this lady in a burqa that was 
that was yellow, safety yellow with the stripes on it like a crosswalk guard. And it said, safety jihadist frowns upon your infidelian or something like that. It was cute, man. And that's my sense of humor, you know? And it's like, people loved it. Uh, TJ's Muslim friends said, that don't offend me, but it offended these two people that are not, not even Middle Eastern, okay, or anything. I'm trying to be nice here, okay? I got raked over the coals just because my sense of humor doesn't match their sense of humor. But, um, you know, we got to loosen up a little bit. I try to tell people all the time, I, I'm like the Dave Chappelle of pastors. You know what I'm saying? I'll, I'll crack on all y'all. I don't care. Red and yellow, black and white. I know we're all precious in his sight, but I'm going to bust your chops eventually because it's fun. I always said I wanted to do to church what Marilyn Manson did to rock and roll. And I don't mean that in an evil way, but I'm saying the, there should have never been this mold of the ugly red carpet, gold chandeliers, ugly wood pews with a certain structure on how to do, air, you know, it just became something you did on Sunday. We are the church. We need to come here and corporately worship the one true God together and sharpen that iron and get back out there and open up a can of whoop. Uh, two little girls just walked in. I can't say it, but whoop ass. So it's like, yeah, amen. Yes. So why would Paul tell every believer everywhere for all time to be manly or to act like men? Well, understand, Paul is not referring to gender. He's referring to maturity. Say maturity. Act like men because men are to be mature. Right, right men? Are you mature? No, you're not, Sean. No, you're not. <laughs> nice try, man. I'm joking. I was talking like a, never mind. The contrast here is not between manhood and womanhood, but manhood and childhood. Remember, uh, Waterboy, you got your man book, or manhood back, Coach Klein. You got your manhood. Um, it's about manhood and womanhood. It's not about, but it's about manhood and childhood. Stop acting like children. That's what the Corinthians were acting like, right? Little whiny tantrum throwing children. They were immature Christians acting like children. And sadly, that right there, nine times out of 10 is responsible for causing 99% of all discord in the body and church splits. My, my home church, CLC down there, they lost like when they decided to build that sanctuary. Look, man, it wears me out doing this once, okay? Stan Tharp is a rock star because he was doing this four times a weekend. Once on uh, Saturday, three times on Sunday. So they wanted to build a bigger sanctuary to accommodate so that he didn't have to do that so much. And then now it's a huge success. It's so nice that national acts come in to do concerts there. You know what I'm saying? So it's totally, it's like a win-win. But 300 people about got their panties in a twist over that and started, I'm sure it only started with a small handful of people and they raised discord and all this kind of stuff and they lost about 300 people over something that's just a beautiful blessing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's a beautiful thing. And it started, with, yeah, it started with one and that's usually how it does. That's why I talk to the leadership team, man. Stop people in their tracks when they're trying to start discord at the first heavy metal church of Christ. You have to. We got to protect this place because Satan really, 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 really hates this place. Really hates this place because God is reaching. Well, first of all, God's using a non-worthy, rusted old vessel like this that's not worthy of this, using this to reach atheists and agnostics and, and the people that were normally shunned from church and everything else. God is awesome. But we have to be even more on guard, man, because he, he, he wants this place to go down. Oh, all churches go through them and uh, we go through them more. more. We, we have more church splits than the average church because we've got a lot of broken people. We have a lot of broken people, a lot of baby Christians. You see what I'm saying? So that's why it's really important to grow here because uh, what do babies do? Kick and scream when they don't, what'd you say? Whine and kick and scream when they don't get their way. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in the faith. 
Paul says, you were acting like little kids. I couldn't treat you like adults. And I experienced this all the time here at uh, uh, FHMCC for about the past nine and a half years, ma'am. It happens all the time. I, I clash with so many Christians out there that the amount of immature baby Christians that I have met, and yesterday just blew my mind. I, I kept it a secret because I didn't want, you know, it's a family thing, but I actually did my dad's memorial service yesterday. Uh, a lot of you didn't know, but he passed a couple of weeks ago. And um, so I'm doing this memorial service. Oh, it was so great to see a lot of his friends there that I hadn't seen in years. And I had, uh, you know, people coming up to me afterwards. Oh, man, thank you for doing this. That was just awesome. Good job. And then I have a family member that is a immature baby Christian, then goes on Facebook and rips it and says it was horrible, a disgrace, all of this kind of stuff about my dad's memorial service, man. And I'm just like, oh, this person that claims Christ. I'm not saying she isn't saved. She's an immature baby Christian that is filled with pride and ego. And what does she do? Is that the best way you're going to share your testimony and, and show your Christ-like, you know, ambassador for Christ? We had people come up yesterday that embraced me and said, Brian, we have to come and check your church out. We have wanted to for so long and and blah, 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 blah. But now, after today, after hearing that, we're gonna, we're gonna go, we're gonna come sometime. And that, to me, that's a Holy Spirit home run right there. You know what I'm saying? People that would never step foot in a church are now saying, wow, you know, wow. And then I've got somebody just, ah, 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 you know, and I'm sitting there looking, I'm like, my goodness, that's what's wrong with the body of Christ. That's what's wrong, you know? Too many buttholes and not enough hands and feet. What's that? Is that what our shirt says, right? Oh, man. Send all hate mail to bsmith at heavymetalchurch.com. I think my mailbox is getting pretty full. Uh, Pinky would like to mess with you, so maybe info at heavymetalchurch.com. Listen, Satan joins churches. He, he joins churches, but he uses Christians, baby, immature, whiny, tantrum throwing Christians more than anything to hurt the progress and the advancement of the kingdom. Nine and a half years, you know what it's done to me? Got me completely disgusted in the American church and in the American Christian. That's what it's done. And maybe that's what God was trying to do because it's lit such a fire under my bum to even go more against the grain and go out there and just absolutely rake up everybody and bring them back to that lifeboat. You know what I'm saying? Please, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm really kind of like pouring out my soul here. So, yeah. There are three main ways immature Christians are like little children. Like children, immature Christians are self-centered, short-sighted, and spiritually unstable. They think mostly about themselves. They don't think about the big picture, and they waffle in what they know and believe. Paul says, stop acting like children. Act like men. Be courageously mature. Remember, Paul said earlier in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child and acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childless, childish things. You know what it looks like to act like a man and be courageously mature? It means to be willing to go first and go last. Men, isn't that what you were taught growing up? Go first and go last. When there is clear and present danger, men go first. Marines, any Marines in here, former Marines? Huh? You Army or Marine? The Marines have a slogan, Marines are the first to go in and the last to come out, and that's the truth. If there is scary sound in your house that sounds just like an intruder, the man is not supposed to say, Kevin's not supposed to, hey, Pam, honey, go check that out. Go check that out. Let me know if there's some, someone or something out there. No. Guys, we're supposed to go first. Now, guys, we're, we're actually scared out of our wits, though, right? I'll admit it. Yeah, we'll go first, but it's just like, you know, it's like, hey, baby, I got this. And then we're in the hallway like, oh, man. Oh, Jesus, oh, in the name of Jesus, please help me out. And if, just give me super strength if somebody's in here. Oh, I got it, baby. You stay there. Get ready to have 911 ready for you. Oh, Lord, help me. I don't want to get shanked in my jammies. I didn't. I don't have any underwear on. 
Some men would have no idea what to do if they saw someone anyway. Um, excuse me, Mr. Shoe Robber, uh, please go away. Ladies, if your man doesn't know how to fire a weapon, you actually have a girlfriend. B. Smith at heavymetalchurch.com. But seriously though, remember that anthrax song, I'm the man. Yeah, we be the men. If she go out there and checked it out and came back to bed and said, Kevin, I handled it. <laughs> you'd feel totally wussified. No, I'm to be the man. I'm the bulletproof vest for my family. That's how all of us are to stand firm and be courageously mature with one another in the church. I don't like John, but I don't go on Facebook and slam him every day. You know? <laughs> What'd you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll do it to his face because I'm a man. You know I love you, man, right? Good. I can't. Yeah, you got something on your face. Listen. Seriously. We are willing to lay our lives down for Christ and for one another. That's what a mature manly womanly christian is not only do men go first oh goodness gracious not only do men go first but men go last when the time calls when there is something to be enjoyed they are willing to go last they go last so others go first we go to the back of the line you know you open the door so that everybody can go in and get their place they go to the last so others can go first we go to the back of the line to make sure our family and everybody's safe in the king's island line and nobody's messing with them we stand in order to let others sit. Well, you should anyway. It's not one of the most pathetic pictures I saw was somebody in their 20s, a, a man in his 20s sitting there on, a, on a, a full bus crowded seat or crowded bus while this woman, uh, old woman with a walker just was standing there on the bus. I mean, that's pathetic, dude. We serve others to let others rest. We put ourselves down to lift others up. We think of others before we think of ourselves. To act like men means for all of us to be courageously mature, willing to go first where there is risk and danger in spiritual war, and willing to go last so that others can go before them. To live an effective Christian life in a difficult world, we must, for, and this, this is the final one, summon strength. Finally, Paul says, be strong. Paul is not talking about physical strength, but spiritual strength. The verb tense is in the present passive imperative. And I know I did not know that, okay? And uh, meaning it must be constantly done to you, not by you. So you, can, you can't spiritually strengthen yourself. Spiritual strength for difficult days doesn't come from within. It comes from without. You can't strengthen yourself for life's battles. You must be strengthened by the Lord. And the only way you're going to do that is to be solidified in the foundation of his word and to pray the, no, not the gimme, 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 but strengthen me, strengthen me, make me wise. I want to know you more. I want to love you more. I want you to use me more. I don't want to be a whiny, baby, poopy diapered Christian anymore. we got to be strengthened by the Lord. Think about it. Navy SEALs training is the toughest training on planet Earth. They beat these men to death psychologically and physically, emotionally, everything. The, what's the, the quit rate, the bell out, you know, because all you got to do is just go ring a bell. It's voluntary. They can just go pack your stuff and go on back to your regular uh, duty station. They weed out the weak and only keep the strongest of the strong, and they put them through hell on Earth. So... You ever see a Navy SEAL, first of all, you'll never see one because they don't brag about it, all right? And, but they are the baddest boys on planet Earth. Shut up, Sean. <laughs> Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. 
Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The only way to live an effective Christian life that honors God and serves the world is with the strength that comes from heaven, all right? That's why you can't clean yourself up enough. That's why we go against the churches and the pastors that say, again, it's idiotic. Oh, you come in here. Oh, 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 you just got saved today. Praise God. So you got saved and you're gay. Okay, great. Then seven days go by. What? You're still gay? You can't, oh, you didn't get saved. You don't, or, oh, wait, what? You're depressed? Wait, you just got saved last week, but you're saying you struggle with depression and anxiety? You didn't really get saved. Nope. Because you, you don't have the joy of the Lord. Idiotic people. Idiots. Idiotic people doing that. Pushing people away from something so beautiful. Homosexuals, you can be saved. Transgender people, you can be saved. Thieves, you can be saved. Liars, you can be saved. Depressed people, I'm one. Battle, well, not anymore. Praise God. Finally, after 47 years, he answered that prayer, and I've never been better. All right? No more anxiety, no more depression. Uh, everybody keeps saying, well, man, we, you know, we've seen a change in you. Yeah, hell yeah, you have. All right? It's because God showed up. It's awesome. Anybody can get saved. Say that. The only people that cannot get saved are the people that blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And if you have done that, you're not watching that video or sitting here anyway. Somebody that's blasphemed the Holy Spirit hates everything of God. They go against God. They worship against God. I mean, they are, they have blasphemed. There's no more hope for them. Anybody can be saved other than that person. Amen? The only way to live an effective Christian life that honors God and serves the world is with the strength that comes from heaven. How do you get it? The main two ways is you get it in God's word, the book, to hear from God, and you get on your knees and talk to God. He speaks to you and you speak to him. You need private, say private. Private, private daily, say daily. daily. Private, daily communion with God. He fills you up and then sends you out. You need weekly corporate worship right here. This is called weekly corporate worship of God. He fills us up and then he sends us out. 80% of the church comes here and gets, not this church. Well, yeah, 80% of this church, of all churches, my bad, comes here. They get to feel good on. They get the Holy Spirit on. They get to the worship on. And then they go right out that door, grab the remote, sit on the couch, get up, go to work, come home, eat, Sit on the couch, watch TV, rinse, repeat, and then come back Sunday. Praise God. Praise God. For you peeps that don't come to church regularly, you are weaker than those of us who do. Now look, not saying we're better. I stumble all the time. So don't think I'm saying we're better. But I just know that if I was a part-timer and not going to church every week, I would be even worse than I am now. Anybody feel me? I would be worse than I am now. So how sad is it when Christian soldier after Christian soldier goes out to the spiritual war day after day and gets defeated because they refuse to get the strength they need from the Lord? Whether you know it or not, you have three main battlefronts. Three main battlefronts you face every day, all day. Do you know what that is? There's three. First, you are battling against the world. Say the world. James 4.4 4 says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, he's not referring to the created world, but to the world's value system, all right? Jesus was a friend to sinners, but his values were the exact opposite of those sinners. I'm a friend of the sinner, okay? Jesus was a friend to the sinner trying to save them, but the values are on the exact opposite, opposite sides of the spectrum. Are yours? You see what the world values and what God values are in conflict with one another. You can't love them both. You can't serve them both. So if you are a Christian, you are constantly having to fight off the world trying to push its agenda and values down your throat. And it's getting worse. It's a constant fight. And if it's not a constant fight for you, you are the guy in Private Ryan. You are. 
Well, I can't believe he just, I, don't, I didn't say it, the Bible says it. If you're not fighting and trying to, if you're not battling your flesh to, ah, with the world, you're, you're that guy. Or what about the mob? You know what I'm saying? Go out and kill and slice throats all week long and all kinds of sex, drugs, and all that kind of stuff, and then they go to church on Sunday and, la, and they take their little communion chip and all that. Okay, walk clean. Let's go back out again. Hey, Tony, let's go get this guy. Boom. Number two, it's a battleground against the flesh. Say flesh. Not the skin on the outside, but the sinful nature you have on the inside. Even after you're redeemed and born again, you have remnants of the flesh that wants to please self. And you will fight that for the rest of your life. So your new nature that wants to please God and your old nature that wants to be, to be pleased, duke it out constantly. And you know who wins? The one you feed the most. The one you feed the most. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. It's a war. Be honest. Do you spend more time having your flesh fed by the things of the world or your spirit fed by the things of God? There is a different or a direct correlation to your effectiveness in this life. If you are fighting the flesh and you are, yeah, then you're going to be doing more of the Lord's work. If you're not, you're that guy in the stairwell of Private Ryan. And the third constant battleground is against the devil himself. Listen, Ephesians 6, 13 says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Whose armor is it? It's God's armor. God's armor is God's strength that he willingly and generously provides it if you will take it and rely upon it. But if you're not taking it up, if you're not asking him for more wisdom and more, it's just like it's just sitting over there in the corner, unused. You might remember or have read about the 1992 track and field Olympics that had one of the most dramatic moments in sports history. There was a British runner in the 400 meter race named Derek Redmond. He had run about 250 meters when he pulled a hamstring and collapsed on the track. The whole stadium crowd of about 65,000 gasped, wondering what he would do. Derek got up and started limping around the track, refusing to give up. Derek Redmond's father was in the stands that day, and when he saw his injured son limping on the track, he got out of his seat, broke through the security, went out on the track to assist his son, assuming he wanted to get off the track. But Derek didn't want to get off the track. He wanted to finish the race. So leaning heavily against his father, Derek Redmond and his father started heading for the finish line. When the crowd saw what was happening, they stood to their feet and began to clap. First it was faint, and then it grew louder and louder as they watched that unforgettable scene. See, they didn't care about who come in first. They were, all eyes were on this unforgettable scene as a father was helping his wounded son make it across the finish line. Now that is how Christians should treat fellow Christians when they fall down and are wounded, when they slip up and are wounded, when they fall back into old ways and are wounded, all right? Instead of, oh, he can't really be saved because, because, oh, he says shit now on a regular basis. And uh, he, uh, oh, 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 he can't be it. I would not want to be, I would not want those people in my army. You know what I'm saying? I want real people who aren't afraid to say, man, I am broken. I am weak. I mess up. I mess up, okay? Maybe you can help me not to mess up. You know, because I know all of you mess up. Those people that point fingers mess up. This life is a fight that we cannot win on our own. It is a race that we cannot finish on our own. We must have the strength, last page, that only our heavenly Father can provide. And yes, we will be wounded. And yes, it will be difficult. But our Father promises to be with us and carry us over that finish line. Why be alert? Because we always have an enemy ready to pounce. Always. 
You might be on a mountaintop. Bad devil ain't messing with me, man. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm like, wah! Well, guess what? That wah is going to be like, mm, someday. I mean, right? You can't be on that Holy Spirit cocaine high for all of your life. Well, that's a bad analogy. Uh, but <laughs> no, anyway. <laughs> I normally say nice to oxide. I was just seeing if you all are awake. Why stand firm in the faith? Because nothing worthwhile is accomplished without a commitment to the truth. If you're just here because you think this is your get out of hell free pass, that's not a relationship with your creator. You're just going through the motions. Why be courageously mature? Because acting childish won't cut it when the battle rages. You know, like the Navy SEALs, when it, the weak fall away to the wayside, that's exactly what's gonna happen when the crap really hits the fan on planet Earth. The Christians that are not deeply rooted, the Christians whose prayer life is only gimme, 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 or bail me out, bail me out, bail me out, and the only Bible knowledge you know is John 3, 16, and you only know that because they hold it up at the foosball game. Why be strong? Because weakness precedes surrender, and quitting is not an option. Don't ever quit. Praise team. Whew. Man. Praise team, praise team. All right, praise team's gonna come up and, and I, I don't ever, I mean, I don't think too many of you do. Some people, you know the people that you went to school with or you work with, they're, they're ha I, half tailors. You know, they do everything half tailed. Half ass, you know what I'm talking about? And I've never, I mean, if there's something worth doing, I try to do it to the best of my ability. You know what I'm saying? I think most of you are like that too. So we have to give our all to Christ. And it's not easy. But I'd like you all to bow your heads right now. Bow your heads. You might be watching or listening today. You might be here. And man, you've just been half telling it. You know? You're not, you're not giving God your best. And you want to change that. Now's the time to change. Now is when God's army needs you most. This world's just gonna keep getting worse. It's so funny, all these people, oh, we finally made it past 2020. The, like some magic's gonna happen at midnight and man, this year's gonna be dope. Dude, this year could be worse than last. That's why I tried to have so much fun last year. Bet your butt when it gets to be high 40s, low 50s, I'm going jet skiing again. Why? because I'm gonna rock on like it's my last, like it's my last day, my last week, my last, and I wanna save people like it's my last day, my last week, my, you know? It, it's time to pull the gloves off and rock. It, you, it's no coincidence, you were placed in this world to be here in the year 2021. You know that? Isn't that exciting? God puts you here, a Christian, in 2021, when everything's just falling apart at the seams? Wow. That's, I think that's pretty cool. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it kind of sucks, but no, not really. Because that means maybe if you just give him your all, maybe he's going to do something amazing through you. Wouldn't it be great to have people run up to you at heaven and be like, thank you. Thank you so much. That just gave me chills, man. When I, thank you so much for telling me about Jesus. Because I wouldn't be here if, if you didn't, if you weren't obedient to God when you did that. So thank you. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that rock? That'd feel good. So for those of you that are saved, but you just want to go all in, we're going to say the salvation prayer, but this is going to be your rededication. And, and for those of you that felt like you couldn't get saved or come to church because you're addicted to this, you're doing this, you're that, you all this baggage, you just, your life, you're going to wait until you clean up a little bit more. Don't wait. It could take years for the Holy Spirit to wash the, the bad stuff out of you. He's still scrubbing on me. This hard. Don't wait on getting your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're going to say a prayer, and if you'd like to be saved or if you'd like to rededicate, let's say it all together so if somebody that wants to, they won't be have any anxiety going on. Let's do it. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I confess now that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Father, 
please forgive me for all of my sins. Please cover them with the blood of Jesus. Please guide my steps from this day forward and use me as you wish. Please guide my steps. Please open and close every door according to your will for my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, if you said that prayer for the first time, welcome to the family. They got a couple of songs. If you're one of the first timers, you can go get your free shirt at the merch counter. Uh, for those being baptized, I'm going to be in my Jeep and leaving this place in 15 minutes. So go to the Jeep if you don't know where we're going. I'll see you guys down at the river and let's congregate very quickly so we can get the onshore stuff um, going and we can pray. God bless you all. Love you. We'll see you next week. Lord willing.
you guys for coming out today. Take that word and message, Brian, present it to you all. Take it and beat on that word. In Jesus' name. Take you to his holy place 
Thank you, folks. Appreciate it very, very much. Happy New Year to all of you all. Thank Be you. safe.